Hi, my name's Andrew Dudley and this is Earth Live, a webcast featuring interviews with people working on the front lines of conservation. Today we have the pleasure of speaking with Dennis Hayes, co-founder of Earth Day, who is joining us from Seattle. Dennis, welcome to Earth. How are you? I'm doing very well, all things considered. Andrew, how are you? I'm doing great, sir. Thank you. Thank you for asking. So before we get to the founding of Earth Day, can you tell us how you got into environmentalism? Um, it's difficult. I suppose a psychologist might say that it was a rebellion against my father. He worked in a paper mill. And back in those days, there were literally no pollution controls. So it just poured out sulfur dioxide and hydrogen sulfide. I woke up every morning for the first 18 years of my life with a sore throat, pitted the roofs of automobiles. We put effluent into the Columbia Slough and killed thousands of fish at a time. To get the trees that filled the paper mill, uh, we did massive clear cutting, just miles and miles and miles of utter devastation. And this was all in the, at the threshold of the Columbia River Gorge, one of the most absolutely gorgeous pieces of property on, on the face of the planet. So I guess amid all of that growing up, I, I had the thought it must be possible to make paper without destroying the earth. Um, and although I, that, that isn't something that I think occurred to me when I was 12, 14, 15 years old, there was no real environmental consciousness in the land, much less in my little paper mill community. Uh, I, I think ultimately all of that was a great motivation to me once my eyes opened up. So going to the, in the late 60s, what was it like for you as a young man growing up in America? Can you give us a sense of the broader events that sparked the movement that led to Earth Day? Yes, well, I'm, I'm even older than that. I, I really grew up in the 50s. But the, the movement itself certainly was rooted in, uh, in the general turbulence of the 60s. It's, it's a decade, particularly in the United States, that uh, was fairly unique, a, a combination of a very strong anti-war movement a very strong civil rights movement, uh, a, a cultural transformation generally summed up with Haight-Ashbury and Woodstock, uh, all of which created a generation, uh, some of it fueled by chemistry, that uh, thought of itself as very different from any generation that had preceded it. Uh, we sometimes refer to ourselves as the first kids who grew up on television. I mean, I, I was 11 years old before I saw my first television set. And that was a transformation, probably not as big as the digital revolution and the kids that are going up on computers and cell phones, uh, where there's an interactivity with all of that. But it, it turned us for a period into sort of passive consumers and then into very robust real world activists. Okay. Do you remember the Apollo 8 mission and seeing the famous Earth Rise image? And, and how did that galvanize the movement? Uh, well, there's, there's, a, a bit of discussion about that. Certainly, I remember it. Certainly, it's a profoundly important uh, photograph. It may be the most reproduced photograph of the 20th century. Uh, I, I don't know that that was as important to the galvanizing of the movement as a great many other things, but it certainly fed into that constellation of things, along with you know, the Santa Barbara oil spill, uh, an air inversion that left 13 states basically gasping for about a month in the middle of the summer, Cuyahoga River catching on fire, uh, riots in cities as people tried to plow eight-lane freeways through vibrant inner-city areas, uh, women in Los Angeles reading in the newspaper that breathing the air is like smoking two packs of cigarettes a day and suddenly realizing that that means that their two-year-old children are smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. I mean, all of that stuff came together in one convulsion that produced the movement. Wow, that is that's pretty scary. So at some point you walked into Senator Gaylord Nelson's office. How did that come about and what happened? Well, Gaylord was one of the first people to, maybe the first, to, to realize that, that, that all of that stuff out there and, and and he was a great conservationist as well as an environmentalist. He cared a lot about uh, national parks, state parks, endangered species. That, that the time was ripe to do something. The something that he decided he wanted to do was um, to hold a campus environmental teach-on on as many college campuses as possible. In the early days of the anti-war movement, there had been teach-ins held across the country where you had one set of people who were arguing that... Uh, the, the 
The spread of communism in Southeast Asia was like a row of dominoes, and if Vietnam were to fall, then naturally Thailand would fall, Laos would fall, Burma would fall, Malaysia would fall. Uh, and others saying, no, what was going on in Southeast Asia was actually a, a neo-anti-colonialist revolt. Uh, they had been oppressed by the Chinese, and then by the French, and then by the Japanese, and then by the French again, and the Americans were getting in there. And what we ought to be doing is getting out. And there was this robust debate with intelligent people on both sides, but in the end, the we ought to be getting out folks clearly prevailed. And Gaylord thought that something like that might be a useful thing to do on the environment. Uh, and... He gave a speech, it was written up in the New York Times, I read about it. I had a few years earlier decided I wanted to work on what we now think of as environmental issues, basically urban ecology, uh, industrial ecology, human ecology. Uh, and, and so I, I flew down to Washington, got a 15 minute meeting with him because I hadn't heard anything about it. And I was at that time at Harvard and I thought I might get the charter to organize Harvard, maybe even to do all of Cambridge, Harvard mm -hmm. and MIT both. Um, so we had a 15-minute meeting. Um, it turned into about three hours. I went back with the charter to organize BOT, and a couple of days later got a call from his chief of staff asking whether I'd drop out and come down and organize the United States. And certainly the most rapid progress in my career ever, <laughs> those three days. Um, and, and then the tragedy, of course, was that the campuses were completely consumed with the anti-war movement, the civil rights issues. And a lot of people were doing uh, countercultural engagements and drugs. And, and, and this environment thing just at that point was not exciting college students at all. And within about a month, I was afraid it was just going to belly flop. But then we reviewed the mail that had come in to Senator Nelson's office. And it turned out almost all of it was from young women uh, typically college educated, typically one or two children. Uh, and they were really touched by this environmental thing. So to, to make a long story short, actually it's not that long, it was fairly swift. Uh, we moved it off of college campuses out into communities, changed it from environmental teaching to Earth Day, and it began to explode. Incredible. I was doing some research for this interview and I was looking back through some of the um, original interviews from, from Senator Gaylord Nelson uh, and I just wanted to cut to a speech he gave in Milwaukee in April 1970. It's tremendously encouraging to see all across this country the uh, remarkable interest on the campuses and off the campuses on an issue which is... Uh, not only uh, just an issue of survival, but an issue of how we survive. I don't think there's any other issue viewed in its broadest sense, which is as critical to mankind as the issue of the quality of the environment in which we live. You hear the word ecology, that's a big science, not a narrow one. It's a big concept. And it is concerned with all the ramifications of all the relationships of all living creatures to each other and their environment. It is concerned with the total ecosystem, not just how we dispose of uh, tin cans, bottles, and our garbage. It is concerned with the habitat of marine creatures, animals, birds, and man. And our goal is not just an environment of clean air and water and scenic beauty while forgetting about the worst environments in America, in the ghettos, in the Appalachians, and elsewhere. Our goal is an environment of decency, quality, and mutual respect for all human beings and all other living, living creatures. An environment without ugliness, without ghettos, without poverty, without discrimination, without hunger, and without war. Our goal is a decent environment in its broadest and deepest sense. And winning the environmental war is a whole lot tougher battle, challenge <clears throat> by far, than any other challenge ever to confront mankind. We could terminate our involvement in Laos in 30 days, and it's my belief we should, and we could terminate our involvement
and we could terminate our involvement in the killings in Vietnam in 120 days, and I think we should. But wish for it, work for it, fight for it, commit unlimited resources to it, nevertheless. The battle to restore a proper relationship between man and his environment, between man and other living creatures, will require a long, sustained political, moral, ethical, and financial commitment far beyond any commitment ever made by any society in the history of man. Are we able? Yes. Are we willing? That's the unanswered question. So we have a, a question from one of our viewers, Mike Kaczynski out of San Francisco, and he's curious to know from the original vision to now, how are we doing as a global population? Well, the, the original vision, of course, was a one-time event. Uh, it was going to be like the March on Selva or the March on the Pentagon. We were going to have this vast convulsion. Uh, the difference being that we were going to be doing it in every city rather than in one location. And, uh, it, it turned out that it was uh, successful in quantitative terms beyond our wildest dreams, an estimated 20 million people participating, making it at that time by far the largest planned organized event in the nation's history. Um, and it created a context in which a wave of legislation was passed, the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Endangered Species Act, Marine Mammal Protection Act, National Forest Protection Act, Toxic Substances Control Act, it's on and on and on. We basically rewrote the laws by which America does business. Um, my expectation was that, you know, we'd done it. Uh, <laughs> it was in the rear view mirror. Uh, but across the country, people organized some stuff again in 1971. And I, I actually worked fairly hard to try to convince them not to do it because no matter what they did, it would not be anywhere near as successful as it was in 1970. And then wow. all the news stories would be, well, the blooms off the environmental rose, let's move on to the next one. Um, but they kept going. And, and in the end, uh, it, it turned out to just have enough momentum that it, it endured as an entity. We, I, I got back involved again on the 20th anniversary and we put together another gigantic campaign. But this time took it international and had things taking place in 141 countries. And, now it has exploded into something where there are events virtually every place from, from the Vatican on to a, a village in Malawi and where the United Nations, when it's going to be uh, trying to ratify the Paris Accords, will do it on Earth Day. Mm -hmm. Or when President Biden calls a climate leaders summit for this spring, it's on Earth Day. And it is, <laughs> none of that was in anybody's mind <laughs> back in 1969 when we were going to try and see if we could focus attention on, on the set of issues for one window in time, but it is it's proven to be an, an enduring legacy. Mm -hmm. You must be very proud. I mean, that just to, to recap on some of the statistics I was looking up, so, you know, it's the largest secular holiday in the world, observed in 192 countries and celebrated by more than a billion people. You mentioned expanding internationally. How easy was it to do that? It was very difficult, uh, in part because we could find no foundations that would support it. So I had to fund the whole thing out of just an overhead budget and my domestic operations for Earth Day campaign. Uh, we had really two full-time paid staff and they weren't paid that much. And then a whole bunch of volunteers who were exchange students. We, we, we organized that out of Palo Alto, California. So we had a bunch of students at Stanford University, at University of California, at Berkeley, at San Jose State. We'd come in a couple afternoons a week and, telephoned their friends back in the countries that they'd come to and try to organize it that way. I, I put together a little stint through Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union, parts of North Africa, just trying to see what we could do to foment uh, a bit of involvement. Uh, so it, it was certainly resource constrained, but it once again, uh, the magic of the name itself, Earth Day, seems to translate very well into every language on Earth. It's just transparent what it is that you were trying to mobilize around. And so that, that worked quite well. A, a disadvantage, candidly, was that we were doing this out of the United States. Mm -hmm. And there were a, a fair amount of resentment in a huge part of the world about the rapacious activities of American corporations abroad and, and 
uh, some views of American tourists is not exactly environmental benign, environmentally benign and the impacts that they've been having around the world. So it, it, there was a, who are you to tell us what to do? And, and the response, of course, is we're not telling you what to do. We're asking you to do something. Mm -hmm. uh, but do something that's appropriate to your culture, to your environment, to your economy, to your politics. I mean, we're going to have a huge demonstration on the mall in Washington, D.C., and it's going to be condemning a lot of things done by government. Mm -hmm. In China, I'm not sure that's a very smart thing to do. But mm -hmm. Figure out what it's appropriate to do in China and do it. Yeah. Where did the idea come from turning the lights off in cities? And how do you go about achieving this? Do you call up the mayor and say, look, we need you to shut the lights off on Earth Day? Yeah, no, it, it, it's very strange. that That's a question that I occasionally get, and it comes out of a little bit of confusion. There's a totally separate thing called Earth Hour that was put together by the World Wildlife Fund, and they reached around the world and got everybody to turn off their lights for one hour in the evening, and you would, in theory, in a satellite, be able to watch this wave of darkness sweeping over the planet and then lighting up again. Uh, I, I've never seen that, actually, that visual, but that was the, I believe, original intent of it. Uh, we had nothing to do with that, uh -huh. sitting and applauding and turning off our lights at the appropriate <laughs> time. Okay, thanks for the clarification. So if they got off to you know a great start in America, can I ask how consistent the momentum's been? Has, has there been a period where it was difficult to engage people? Well, the, the sort of awkward truth is that Earth Days are always most successful when you've got a bunch of villains in power. Um, so if you've got a Nixon administration, as we had for the first one, it was relatively easy. When you've got a Reagan administration, it's relatively easy. When you have a Clinton or an Obama or a Jimmy Carter administration, there's a, a sense that you know, we've got decent people in power and, and you know we, we've got other priorities. Everybody has 50 things that they care about. The environment right now seems to be pretty well in, in decent shape. So we have our, our biggest and most successful domestic Earth Days historically uh, when we have the most anti-environmental leadership in Washington, D.C. Uh, one huge exception to that, uh, and that was the pandemic. I mean, we have the most anti-environmental president in American history. We've got the climate crisis getting just an enormous amount of energy, particularly from young people around the planet over the last couple of years. Uh, the, the Greta phenomenon, as we think of it, but mm -hmm. writ large, we have tens of thousands of little Gretas uh, heading up their organizations, many of them, again, female, um, and uh, tying climate as an issue into climate justice as an issue in a very, very uh, emotionally compelling fashion. So we had all of that put together. We had Greta and those thousands of others. We had the Green New Deal sponsors in the United States. We had Pope Francis. We had this huge array of things put together that I, I thought that Earth Day 2020, which would have been our 50th anniversary, was going to just blow the hinges off the doors. This was the time when we were just going to make a demand on the kind of bold changes that are necessary in policy literally around the world, where, where we would come together, not as Americans or Brits or Aussies, but come together as homo sapiens, to say mm -hmm. we have to preserve ourselves and the rest of life on the planet. And of course, by the time that Earth Day rolled around, uh, those two years of organizing just uh, bit the dust. Literally everything that we planned to do uh, was illegal. You couldn't have huge crowd mm -hmm. demonstrations anyplace. And, and focusing in on COVID, what do you think is has kind of been, the, is there a silver lining to what everyone has gone through in the last year? Um, I don't see much of a silver lining when, when you're talking about a couple of million people that died. And, uh, I don't know that the lessons that have been drawn from it are as widespread as they should be. I mean, folks like you and I will take a look at it and say, well, one reason that things like a coronavirus affect humans are that they act as no uh, diseases and they come out of bats or come out of pigs or come out of something. And to the extent that we move our uh, farms, move our suburbs into areas where those critters lived, uh, with that increased interaction, there's going to be a transposition of new disease vectors. That That's not something that I think most people took away from the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, it's much more 
probably that there was a market, a wet market in China where this stuff happened and it made the transition to humans, but they didn't draw the environmental, let alone the climate consequences out of it. And some people think that there's some good news from the fact that uh, as a result of the pandemic, carbon emissions took a very serious dip around the whole planet in the year 2020. Uh, but there'd never been any great mystery that if you shut down economic activity and you basically stopped operating airlines, <laughs> that carbon emissions would go down. It's just that's not the way that most of us had planned to take carbon emissions down by throwing millions and millions of people out of work. Um, so I, 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 don't, I don't find a great silver lining out of it. The one thing that maybe, if I stretch to be optimistic here a bit, may have come out of it, and I think more in a bunch of other countries than in mine, I'm thinking of places like New Zealand and Taiwan, where they were very effective at stopping the spread of COVID-19. Uh, there was a sense of, of coming together, that, we, mm -hmm. that the mask is essential and the gloves are essential, not because they protect me so much as that they protect us, you and me, and we're in this uh, all together as a species. I, I'm embarrassed that in America there is developed this great political thing where if you are a, a conservative, you're expressing your freedom by not wearing a mask. Uh, as you may know, the governor of Texas just released all things as basically encouraging people to be going maskless in Texas. It's, it's bizarre. But, but for much of the planet, I do think that there was that coming together and a recognition or an optimism that comes out of if we do all recognize that this is a shared problem and mm -hmm a pandemic and climate are certainly ultimate shared problems, we can work together to, to fix it. And looking ahead, what would you like to see the legacy of Earth Day be? Well, I, I suppose much as in 1970, I like it to be something where uh, we don't need it anymore. There, there's a, a thing that tends to happen to holidays under the best of terms. And one of the things that I've, I've uh, frequently over the course of the last 50 years had to do with regard to Earth Day is to become institutionalized in ways that cause them to lose their vibrancy, uh, their real meaning for people. When you talk about Christmas, it bears no relationship at all to the ancient holidays that were celebrating Christmas or Easter uh, or, in, I, I don't know all the international things, but in, in my country, Labor Day, which at one point was a celebration of a, a movement that had all sorts of uh, progressive values embedded in it. Now it's an opportunity to sell mattresses at discounts, <laughs> automobiles. Uh, and so Earth Day thus far has continued to have content uh, and to be usable as a mobilizing mechanism uh, to push for change and then to celebrate change when you're successful. Uh, and I, I hope that to the extent that it continues in the future, that will be the role that it plays. And uh, if it stops playing that role, I'd, I'd just as soon have it go away. And so for a young person seeking a career in conservation uh, or to become an environmentalist, what advice would you give them? Um, really get knowledgeable. There, there, There is a a lack in many places of folks who really have a depth of understanding of the science um, that and, and whatever you go into, the, the, the science, the law, the economics, so whatever dimensions you pursue, that, that folks have basically good instincts, but don't really think through all of the implications of one uh, approach versus another. And I, I, I think we're now, and then I, it's advice that I think is being followed by a great many people already, but it, it's useful for anyone. Uh, you will never learn as much or as rapidly as you do between the ages of maybe six and 20. And that's a time when uh, you ought to just fill your brain with as much knowledge as you possibly can. Remain curious throughout your life, continue to educate yourself throughout your life, but it's much more difficult for someone my age to master new concepts than it was when I was 60 years younger. <laughs> and just in closing, uh, I'm curious, is, is there a book that you would recommend for us to read that has inspired you and your work? 
Um, well, I, 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 I don't want to be a downer in all of this, but, but a book that I uh, found opened my eyes in a way that they had been not fully opened before about the current wildlife crisis in the world is Elizabeth Colbert's book, The, the Sixth Extinction. And it's beautifully crafted and meticulously researched and absolutely compelling. And you come out of it, I think, any intelligent person who reads it with a recognition that it's an absolute necessity to take very great chunks of the earth and protect them in their natural state for the biodiversity and for all of the, the ecosystem values that they present to us. Excellent. Thank you for that recommendation. So, Mr. Hayes, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you join us on Earth Live today, and we really wish you the best of luck moving forward. And thank you for everything you've done. It's a pleasure to talk with you, Andrew. Hope thank we meet in person sometime when this pandemic is over. <laughs> Excellent. Looking forward to it, sir. Take care.